For this week's Challenge Wednesday, we have our patient, Danny, and Danny is being evaluated in a neurological recovery unit after a sudden onset of gait and limb ataxia. The patient has pin, impaired pin prick, pin prick and thermal sensation on the left side of the face, but diminished pain and lateral or sorry, I need to go back, y'all. Hold on, hold on, hold on. God darn minute. I'm messing this up. Hold on. I got to make sure y'all got this. All right. So the patient has impaired pinprick and thermal sensation on the left side of the face, but diminished pain and thermal sensation over 50% of the body on the contralateral side. I'm sorry. I had to do that again. All right. So the question still says, which of the following conditions is the most likely present? So we have A, left cerebral infarction, B, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy c is left lateral medullary stroke and d is a hemisection injury of the spinal cord all right so let's go up to the top knock this puppy down we got this y'all don't worry about it. we got this so this is a little neurological differential question obviously we've got to figure out what's going on here we got danny is being evaluated in this neurological recovery unit cool that's pretty straightforward and then after a sudden onset of gait and limb ataxia. So I want to slow up there and let's make sense of what we got here. Straight up patients in neurological recovery unit. That doesn't make much difference uh, for this right now. But it does say after a sudden onset of gait and limb ataxia. Now, just keeping that in mind, what is ataxia, that involuntary uh, or, or, or lack of voluntary control or coordination, uh, typically when a person's doing some type of action, you know, it could be ambulation, it could be reaching out to grab something. It's usually faulty movements caused by the, pro uh, the person not having good coordination. All right. And so we need to keep that in mind because there's a there's a few different type of pathologies that could cause a taxi. Can you give me some of those right now? What would you think? What do you think right now? Stroke for sure. Okay. I got that one. I got that one. What else we got? Any, any other types of, some of y'all are saying some going on with the cerebellum. Yeah. That's actually one of the big ones. You know, if the cerebellum has an infarction or if there's cerebellar damage, that could potentially cause a taxi as well. So that's something that we're keeping in mind as we're moving down the question. Now it says that the patient has impaired pinprick and thermal sensation on the left side of the face. I'm going to stop there real quick because I messed this up the first time I was reading it. I didn't really mess it up. I was just kind of... Kind of, I don't know, something happened to me, y'all. I don't know what was happening. But we need to slow up on this part because I don't want you to get confused and I don't want to be confused either. So it says the patient has impaired pinprick. Let's stop there. Impaired pinprick. What does that mean to you? Well, you know that uh, pinprick is a part of our neural examination. What are we testing for, though, is my question. We're testing for pain sensation. Am I right? Okay. Pain. So here it's saying that the patient has impaired pinprick and impaired thermal sensation on the left side of the face. So really what that's saying is the patient has impaired pain and temperature on the left side of the face. So you got to think about well, what potential pathologies could be causing that. Go ahead, write that puppy down. If you're on the road right now, I know I, I I got you all messed up. You probably need to pull off to the side of the road and listen to this. All right, so it says, but diminished pain and thermal sensation over 50% of the body on the contralateral side. Okay, so now they're saying that the patient has diminished pain and, and temperature sensation over 50% of the body on the opposite side. So which of the following conditions is the most likely present? Now, can I give you a little pointer? What I would do on the actual MPTE is I would slow up, take this in parts just like we're doing here. I would use my laminate paper right now to kind of break up this information to make sure that, first of all, I was understanding it and reflecting correctly, but also that I was using the information to rule in and rule out the answer choices. I wouldn't try to keep all of this kind of bound in my head. I wouldn't try to do that because you're going to wind up confusing yourself and then getting the wrong answer. For those on the podcast, let me review the answers for you again. A says left cerebral infarction. 
B is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. C is left lateral medullary stroke. And D is hemisection injury of the spinal cord. Let's go down the roster here. A says left cerebral infarction. So when they say cerebral, don't confuse that with cerebellar. We didn't say that. It's cerebral infarction, meaning, well, those are the major types of strokes that we normally hear about. Middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. So they're talking more about that. Notice how they didn't say what specific uh, you know, stroke it was. They didn't say if it was an ACA or an MCA. They just said it's on the left side and it's a cerebral infarction. Now, my question to you, can cerebral infarctions create limb ataxia, gait and limb ataxia, yes or no? If you're saying no to that, uh, that's not quite true because you can actually have ataxia that is uh, caused by someone having an anterior cerebral artery stroke. It can happen. All right. So I don't want to rule out A because of that. My question to you is what about the face? If a person has a cerebral stroke, a cerebral infarction, what happens to the face and what sides really affect it? All right. So this is the tricky part. So if you got a left CVA, it actually causes contralateral problems with the face, not ipsilateral problems. So if I had a left cerebral infarction or a left CVA, it actually causes right facial drooping or right facial problems, not left. So see, I don't like that because in this question, it says that the patient has impaired pinprick and thermal sensation on the left side of the face. That is not consistent with a left CVA. And so I'm going to go ahead and put an X next to A. Doesn't make sense. Let's go to B. B says acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. That is a mouthful. Do you really know what that's actually called, though? There's another name for it that you're probably more familiar with. It's Guillain-Barre syndrome. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy is another way of us saying Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, can Guillain-Barre syndrome present to you with uh, you know, changes in thermal sensation and, and sensation just generally speaking? Yes, it can. But the one thing about Guillain-Barre is, does it affect like one side of the body? Does it just go up one part of the body, one leg, one arm, or does it affect symmetrically bilaterally it's, it's 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 bilateral right so i wouldn't expect to see one side of the face being affected and then one side of the body being affected that's just not how guillain Barre uh presents and so i'm gonna go ahead and mark out b it just doesn't fit here y'all with me so far okay we're knocking these down let's look at c c says left lateral medullary stroke left lateral medullary stroke so when i'm looking at this one we got to watch out see these neurological uh pathologies a lot of them have like multiple names for them left lateral medullary stroke it's also called a posterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke all right it's also called wallenberg syndrome have you ever heard of those okay so all of those are the same exact thing i know that frustrates you like why the heck don't they just keep the same dang name i get you i'm with you don't kill the messenger c says left lateral medullary stroke the one thing i could tell you is that a left lateral medullary stroke or a medullary stroke in general can present with the onset of gait and limb ataxia all right because you got to understand that the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the artery that supplies that, that inferior part of the cerebellum, that's the one that receives the information about what the body's doing. Like as far as like, you, you know, placement and proprioception uh, related to your limbs and so forth. So if that part of your cerebellum isn't receiving good information, guess what happens? Guess what happens? you start to end up with things like a taxi. So it makes sense here that the patient would present with that. I like it. How about the patient having impaired pinprick and thermal impaired thermal sensation on the left side of the face? Does that fit with a lateral medullary stroke? It does. Why? Because, see, cranial nerve 5, which is trigeminal, it actually 
it, it actually has a nucleus that moves throughout the entire brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, the medulla. And so when you have a medullary stroke, you affect cranial nerve five as well. Yeah. So what I want you to know right now, what I need you to put in your notes is that if your patient presents to you with a left lateral medullary stroke, they're going to have left-sided facial loss in pain and temp. That fits. But how about this contralateral loss of pain and temp on, with the body? Do I get that with a lateral medullary stroke? And the answer is yes. Why? Because you have this thing called the spinal thalamic tract, specifically the lateral spinal thalamic tract that comes up through the spine and it, it's on its way trying to terminate, you know, it, it, into that parietal lobe so we can get the sensation and all that. Well, it's on its way up through the spinal cord, but we know that it also um, it goes through the medulla as well. And so if there is damage to the medulla, we are now going to have problems with the contralateral side of the body as far as pain and temperature sensation, for sure. All right? But why is it contralateral? Well, it's contralateral because the spinal thalamic tract actually crosses over pretty quickly. It, when it goes into the spine, when it comes into the spine, it crosses over pretty quickly within about two to four levels. All right? And so it's already crossed over, and that's the reason why we have contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Bottom line, what am I trying to tell you here? The left lateral medullary stroke fits this clinical picture. I love it. Remember, it's also called Wallenberg's. I'm going to put a, a check next to that for now. Let's look at D. D says hemisection injury of the spinal cord. Now I'm going to tell you why I don't like this one. I don't like this one. Well, hold on. Hold on. I got to back up because hemisection injury is also known as what? You should know the hemisection injury is also known as brown Saquard syndrome. All right. So we're dealing with brown saquard. Now, the thing about brown saquard is, doesn't it have weakness? Isn't like one of the major components of brown saquard having weakness on one side of the body? Well, does this question say anything about that? It does not. You know, one thing that this question says that's really interesting, though, is it says the patient has impaired pinprick and thermal sensation on the left side of the face. When have you ever seen a patient with brown Saquart syndrome that has sensation loss in the face? Spinal cord doesn't go up that high. And so if someone had, let's say, a T6 brown Saquart hemisection injury of the spinal cord, you're not going to see a loss of pain and temp of the face. Because again, the spinal cord doesn't go up that high. So that should be a specific clue for you to go ahead and eliminate D. It doesn't make sense. Leaving us with our final answer of C. Let's freaking get it. I know this one was tough. Like I said, you probably had to jump off the treadmill for this one, stop the car, and kind of listen back through this one. There's a lot of information here. My strategy, Coach K's strategy for you with this one, is to make sure that when you're reviewing the question and there's a lot of information, you break it up into its individual parts. Maybe use your laminate paper. Use a little sheet of paper on the side and write, jot down some of the notes that you have and then take one note at a time ruling in and ruling out answer choices. That's how I do it. That's how I confirm with confidence that I'm getting this question correct.